Um, I totally forgot that Keynote doesn't stick on my awesome fonts uh, in with the slides, which has now very upset me. Okay. Um, yes. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so a tiny bit about me. Uh, yeah, so I'm a web developer. I work at, at Evil Sky in uh, Leeds. We don't officially call them Evil Sky, it's kind of implied. Um, <laughs> I'm non-binary, so I use they, them pronouns. Um, my, Twitter hands, my Twitter handle is Kitation, and I have it at the top of every slide, because I always forget, like I watch a talk, and I'm so busy taking notes, I forget to write the Twitter handle down, and I spend the rest of the talk going, I want to tweet you and tell you how awesome you are. Please tweet me and tell me how awesome I am. <laughs> Uh, content warnings. Um, yes, so there's going to be discussion of things like uh, anxiety, depression, and panic. No details, because um, obviously I don't want to trigger myself either, because that would make the talk quite short. Um, I'm also not a therapist, um, and I'm kind of when I do talk about mental health, people always come and ask me questions about their situations. I don't mind people asking me if you want to ask me about my, my experiences or whatever, but I don't want to give you any mental health advice, because uh, that would be bad for all of us. Um, and also to remember that I'm not you and that it's okay to kind of sit through this and think, I really should be relating to this because I have depression too, but I actually don't really understand anything you're saying or actually these things don't really work for me. And that's fine because we're not all the same people. Um, and that depression and anxiety, even though they are really common, and it is kind of what a lot of mental health talks are about, but there are many, many more mental health conditions, you know, things like OCD, things like bipolar, that aren't being talked about enough, but I don't have those, so I don't really feel comfortable talking about them. And it's always, be it's always better to talk to people than assume something. So I do a talk about gender and how to ask people what gender they are. Um, and I found that some people kind of go back to other non-binary people and say, oh, I know what's best for you because I've seen a talk on it. Um, and that's terribly heartbreaking for me because I'm going, no, talk to people, please. Um, so yeah, discussion is always better than assumption. So the idea for this talk came from, uh, there's a really cool initiative called Geek Mental Help Week. It's quite small. Um, the idea is there's a week in October where there's loads of cool events that go on. Um, I think it's most of the UK, actually. Um, but there's a site where people put up blog posts, they put up podcasts, put up videos. And I've done talks for them before. Um, I do one about why CBT is like project management, because I'm really cool like that. Um, but I wrote this blog post for them last year, which is called There's No Line in My Timesheet for Panic Attacks. I was having a very bad week, um, and it got to the end of the week, and I had to do my timesheet. And I felt really bad because I'm there going, I totally did 37 and a half hours on this project because there was no way on the timesheet to go. I did two hours a week on this project and I spent the rest of it like panicking or crying or hiding in a cupboard or whatever. And loads of people actually came back to me and said, yeah, yeah I really struggle with timesheets as well. I really struggle with these things. And it got me thinking that actually we think that programming is our work or we think that designing is our work or whatever your day job is. You think kind of the thing we produce is the work that we do. But actually, there's loads of little things yes. that are part of that. Um, and those things are hard, too. That the actual work might be fine. Like, programming, for me, doesn't really ever tend to get hard, even when I'm very anxious or depressed. It's all the other things I do around my job that cause me trouble. So what's it like having a mental illness in the workplace? So I kind of want to cover a little bit about that. Um, and then we're going to kind of look at a few things that happen in your day-to-day -day job that... I personally struggle with um, and kind of look at some, some kind of cool solutions to those. First of all, it's really, really tiring. So this is kind of things that, so I've done this talk for my workmates who are mostly kind of neurotypical uh, white guys and they kind of don't really have, they're, they're trying to help but they, they don't really understand that for themselves. So I've been trying to say to them, this is what it's like. It's physically very tiring if you've ever had something like a panic attack, um, if you've had a panic attack for four hours. That's really, really tiring because you, your body's going, isn't it? Like your heart rate's going and all that stuff. Your body's very doing something. You're very mentally kind of alert looking for stuff. Um, and that's really, really tiring really quickly. And it's mentally very tiring because we don't like to go into work. You know, when people say, how are you in the morning? You don't say, right, I'm having an existential crisis or right, I'm feeling really depressed today for no reason or I'm having a massive anxiety issue because I dropped my pen on the floor this morning because a lot of these things aren't logical. You know, if you come and say, I'm having a bad day because you know, something bad happened to me, people understand that. But if you go, I'm anxious, no idea why. People don't really understand that. So we try to pretend that we're neurotypical. We try to pretend that we are fine all the time. When someone says, hi, how are you? You say, I'm fine. Because if you play with anything else, people get freaked out. But keeping that up, having to kind of maintain that persona is really, really mentally tiring. And 
the work that we do is already mentally tiring, right? Things like programming, things like designing, things that are creative or logical problem solving, they're hard things to do. They, they take up a lot of our mental space because they're difficult. So actually, you've got all that space taken up by work. Then you have a lot of space taken up by not being well, which means the amount of energy we've got left for everything else is tiny. You know, we were talking about spoon theory, I guess, earlier. It's the same kind of principle. So actually, I need to plan how I spend my energy, even if it's for something really, really tiny or something that someone else might think is inconsequential. So, oh, hey, we're just going to have a five-minute chat about designing this form or something. And I think, oh, I didn't plan the energy for that, so actually I'm going to find that really difficult. And it's incredibly isolating as well. This is something I, I don't think people understand is that... So I did actually a tiny survey because I thought, I don't want to just talk about myself, even though I do love talking about myself, but I want to talk about other people. And the thing that came back from that that I hadn't really considered, um, even though I do struggle with it, is open offices um, and how they're very difficult environments to work in. And so the way most people deal with it is that we have our headphones on all the time. And we know that headphones are the universal sign of leave me alone. But sometimes for me it's, I really want to interact with you, I really want to talk to you, I really want to go to this meeting, I really want to do some paired programming, I want to do all these cool things, but I can't actually cope with taking my headphones off right now. Like, they're protecting me from the world around me. Um, it can be hard to admit you need help or space, especially if you're already in a, like a demographic that's underrepresented. You, know, you already feel that, as a, a not man in a, in a very male-dominated environment, I feel that I'm already in a weak position, and so when I say, Oh, actually, you know how I probably shouldn't be here because of my gender. I also shouldn't probably be here because I'm, you know, I'm having a mental problem right now. And that's very difficult. And it can be hard to socialise if you don't drink. We have a massive problem with alcohol in the tech industry. And lots of people who do have a mental illness like, don't drink either because so alcohol will exacerbate your symptoms or you're on drugs that interact with alcohol really badly. But you don't want to sit there through a social event and people going like, oh, do you want a beer? No, thank you. Why not? What's wrong with you? Why aren't you drinking? And to have to explain that to people all the time is very annoying. Or if you just don't like big social events or whatever. And I think that I get a reputation for being quite cold and for being quite antisocial. And I'm not. I just don't want to go to the pub with you all the time. Or I don't want to go to a social with like 300 developers. It's a bit stressful. Cool. I'm totally struggling with this mic. I do apologise. So hopefully with those things in mind, we can kind of think about things that we do throughout our day. So the original version of this talk, I kind of went through everything we do in a day, but then it was 50 minutes. Um, <laughs> yes, apparently it's a big topic. So I just want to boil it down to a couple of things that I particularly struggle with. And yeah, there's a lot of crossover. A lot of these things kind of come down to really basic things. So I want to talk about meetings. Um, we all hate meetings. Nobody likes meetings. Um, project managers might like meetings. But no one really enjoys meetings, but they're kind of necessary because we have to communicate with other people because we work in a collaborative environment, etc. Um, and that meetings go from anything from... So we know things like stand-ups or retrospectives or planning. We know those are meetings. You have the big, like, all-hands meeting where a big director stands up in front of all of you and tells you how much profit they're making, and you're going, where's my pay rise? Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> or even just as someone says to you, like I said before, if uh, another developer says, hey, can we have five minutes to chat about this? That's still a meeting. Um, even though we perhaps don't consider it to be a meeting in the traditional sense. Um, I'm a bit of a calendar watcher. I'm always checking my calendar. It doesn't change that often. Like, I don't really do a lot. But I'm always checking, like, every morning I check my calendar. Which means, to me, meetings kind of... They occupy a space in my head. They just kind of sit there, like, looming over you, kind of going, there's a meeting later, there's a meeting later. Um, especially if I know I'm going to have to speak in that meeting, so if it's a retrospective or something like that, right now I'm going to have to stand around and say something. It takes up a lot of headspace that I don't necessarily have. So having an agenda is a really good thing. We recently had a meeting that was announced half an hour before the meeting. Everybody had to go. There was no details. And I panicked because I thought, I'm going to get fired. Because that's what a big all-hands late notice meeting means. It didn't. The director just wanted to talk to us about how amazing he is. Um, <laughs> uh, which, which is oh, intense. Um, but... <laughs> You know, but that kind of stuff. So having an agenda, it kind of helps you, even if it's just tiny, even if it's just like, I want to talk about this project. At least it kind of gives you, so you've got to go, okay, I know how much energy I might need to spend on this thing. Agenda, we don't think agendas are cool because we want to have cool meetings where we just collaborate in booths, but agendas are really, really useful. Uh, don't cancel them at the last minute. My original version of this, when I was doing it for my workmates, they cancelled it literally at the last minute. And I had taken up a lot of headspace because this is very nerve-wracking, especially, I don't know any of you or many of you, so it doesn't really matter that I'm telling you all that I'm, you know, having issues. But when you're talking to your workmates, that's really difficult. And so I was kind of worrying about it all day. They cancelled at the last minute, and I lost the rest of that afternoon because I just had all that energy builds up in your head. 
and then it has nowhere to go. Well, it had somewhere to go. It went into kind of terrible anxiety. Um, just be considerate of people's time, pe people's energy levels. Even if you think this meeting is tiny, not everybody does. Um, but also don't cancel them, because I think that... Oh, I said cancel, didn't I? But things like stand-ups and things. Like, don't think... I find that when we're stressed out, when there's a deadline looming, the first thing to go are things like stand-ups, things like communicating with each other, those kind of touch points. And it's really easy to go, like, oh, well, there's no point having a stand-up. That's the most important time to have a stand-up. That's the most important time to connect to people. If your stand-ups provide routine, so either... Um, we tend to do ours in the morning, so for me, they're a way to start my day. We have remote developers, so for them, that's the only time they get to talk to us. Um, so if we just cancel the stand-up, that affects me and it affects them. It's not just a mental health issue, it's a be considerate of other people around you. And I was thinking about retros, um, because I really like retrospectives. Again, I used to be a project manager, so I, I like post-it notes a lot. Um, but they can be quite stressful, because either... We're in a room that's very noisy and I can't hear everybody. But you basically have to sit there and say, these are all the things that have gone wrong this week. And we don't, like, we, we don't word it like that. We word it in some kind of awful way of like, what could we do better or whatever. But you're basically saying all the things I've hated doing this week. Um, and that could be really, really stressful, especially if you're new to a team or you are having issues or all the bad things happened to you in that week were mental health issues that weren't necessarily work related. Um, and one thing that worked for me really well at a previous job was we had a retro wall. So we had a bit of paper on the wall, and it said retro wall, very original. Um, and you just put post-it notes on it. Everyone could put a post-it note on it all the way through a project. So when you, get to the end of the when you get to the end and you want to retro it, and you want to say, oh, what did we do? What did we not do so well? The project manager can just read out those post-it notes. People don't have to speak then, so they can kind of write whatever they want. It's semi-anonymous, unless you know everyone's handwriting really well. So think about how could we make... So we could take pressure off things like retrospectives and planning and stuff by letting people kind of write stuff on a post-it note, but they don't have to read it out. Or they could go through a proxy. Um, they could, you can kind of go to your scrum master or project manager or whoever's leading the project senior developer and say, look, I'm a, I think like, this has gone horribly wrong this week, but I don't want to say that. Can you say that for me? Um, and maybe we could apply that to other meetings. And I want to talk about code reviews. Um, I get this might not apply to everybody in the room, and I apologise, but I really, really hate code reviews. Um, but we all kind of go through this process, right, that you do a piece of work and then someone comes and criticises it. Um, and there's advantages to this. There's, you know, obviously we all need to stay on the same page. We need to make sure that developers kind of know what we're doing. We need to make sure we're not installing, like, massive dependencies over and over. You know, I've worked on projects that have, like, ten versions of React for some reason or whatever's going on. Um, helps us to avoid big mistakes, it helps us to, uh, you know, if you're doing a lot of work around security or personal data, it's actually kind of, you kind of have to have someone else look over that and make sure you're not doing anything terrible. Um, and it kind of, you know, helps with all those cool things, metrics, you know, code quality and maintainability and all those things we really, really like as developers. So this is what a code of you looks like in GitHub. Um, so it's just a text box where someone writes what's wrong with your code or what they like about your code or whatever. But it's really hard to get tone and context from text. Um, so if you kind of look at the text we've got here, like, like this sure is some code, right? Like, am I being sarcastic? Am I being funny? Am I being angry? Um, am I being dismissive? You, people who know me will know what I mean. But new people to the team, they don't know what that means. If they get that comment, what are they supposed to make of that? There's no context. There's no, there's no tone. There's no, there's no empathy. Um, and also, I find that because reviewing is something that's asynchronous in that, you know, you just kind of say, I've done some work now, and then at some point someone will pick that work up and start looking at it. If I know someone's reviewing my work and I can see them, like, and then you just see them, like, typing furiously, and I just kind of sit there and think, what are they saying? What have I done? What did I forget? What's going on? You know what I mean? It kind of, I shouldn't be worrying about it. I should just go, this is going to get reviewed, and at some point someone's going to come up with a load of comments and I'll fix them, and it's mostly going to be typos, and that will be fine. But... <laughs> Actually, you know, I sit there and worry about it. It takes up headspace again, you know, that this concept that my head is just full of things that haven't happened yet. And that's kind of what anxiety is. It's I'm worried about all these things that haven't happened yet. Um, and the thing I hate most about code reviews is this sentence. So this is from Thoughtbot. I think it's Thoughtbot. <laughs> it is. Um, this is from Thoughtbot's um, code review guidelines. And it's a bit like code of conduct, where people get these code of view guidelines and copy and paste them into their project and don't read them. Um, but, you know, there's similar sentences in a lot of 
con contributor guidelines, things like, don't take it personally, I guess, is the most common way this is phrased. But the reviews of the code, it's not of you. It's not, you know, we're just reviewing the code because we're really logical, because we like to think that we're logical people and we're not being emotional about it. And all that, you can't see where I'm going with this. Um, <laughs> all that kind you know, all that kind of stuff. You're going, no, this is, it's just the code. It's, just, it's not personal, it's just the code. I hate this sentence. I hate this sentence more than I hate anything. Not, not anything, okay? Like, there's things I hate more, but uh, it's spiders. Um, <laughs> But I hate this. I hate this slide. I hate this. I don't, I don't hate the slide. I hate the concept. Animations. Yeah, I know keynote. Um, this erases the fact that the person you're reviewing is an actual human being with thoughts and feelings. It gives people permission to be a dick, and then when you say stop being a dick, they say, "But I'm just reviewing the code." It's not you. Why are you taking it personally? It puts emphasis on me as someone who takes it personally that I'm wrong, I'm in the wrong, you know, because I've taken it personally, I've been offended by it. It's good to tell people that personal insults are bad in code reviews. Um, it's good, you know, you don't want to have code reviews that are just like, oh, this is what a woman would write, or, you know, what kind of university did you go to, or like, how can you be so stupid to do that, you know? It's good to say to people, don't do that, obviously. But it does give people license to forget that there's a person behind the PR, there's a person behind the code, there's a person behind the work. Especially if you kind of work in remote teams where you might not have ever seen the person who's doing the review for you, you know, if you're working kind of for something like open source or like a remote team or whatever. And it forgets the fact as well that we're really protective over things that we create. I'm a really strong believer that programming is a very creative process. It's not just purely logical, it's not just kind of you know, it's not just kind of like I'm just going to do some typing and I'm going to type this beautiful logical thing and there's nothing, you know, it's, it's, it's objective, right? Code is objective. Um, but it's not, you know, it's something, you know, how many times you hear the sentence saying like, oh, don't change that, like that's his baby, that's their baby, you know, like, oh my God, like I can't believe you're going to like refactor that, like, oh, oh no. <laughs> it, I work for Dropbox and that's not the sense of the sentence at all. No, I get that it's not, but that's, that's kind of my point, that people will write that and that no, they, they mean something behind it. Yeah, I, I, can't, I do get what you mean, and I don't, I, I'm definitely not attributing malice to it at all. I just think that this is experiences of people I've worked with and the way that they deal with kind of certain things. I don't know where I got to. Yes, sorry. Um, you can't assume that people are stupider than you. Um, I went to a really good talk, and I can't remember the name of it, or the person who gave it. It was that good. Um, but there was a really good talk. <laughs> there was a really good talk at uh, PyCon UK a couple of years ago, which was about how to deal with conflict, um, you know, in a, in a meeting or whatever. And he said, you can't assume that the people in the room are stupider than you. But there might be things that you go, oh, how could you do that? That's really obvious you shouldn't do that. But actually, you know, there's loads of reasons people do certain things because you've not gone through that whole thought process with them. I think the way to fix code reviews, or not fix code reviews, um, but things to do like, Doing the code review together, so if you can, if you're in the same space, um, sitting with the reviewer, say, look, at two o'clock I'm going to review your code, can we kind of sit down and go through this? Then you get context, you get tone, because you're having, we're better at dealing with those, obviously, in verbal conversations. You remember that the person's a human being because you're sat there talking to them. You know, you, that just, for me, seems like better. And they're really cool tools now. We can do this online, you know, things like Screen Hero or Slack or IRC or, like, Facebook or like, whatever people use to talk to each other. You know, you can do... Just remember the other person you're talking to is a human being. So how do you talk to somebody in your office who's having mental health issues? Well, you should talk to them for a start. Um, you should be open and available, especially if you're in management. Um, I'm not kind of expecting everybody to go back to work and be like, right, I know this person, my team's depressed, and I'm going to fix them. Um, <laughs> but just have a, have a private space in your office where you can kind of talk to people. Don't have this conversation in a stand-up. Um, or, you know, it's in the middle of a desk or something like this, like have a cool space. But also listen. Um, talking and listening aren't the same thing. I guess kind of, I do feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the converted. Um, but, you know, it's take everything in. Don't kind of interject in the middle and go, oh, no, but that's a tiny thing. You shouldn't be worried about that. Or, oh, no, like, no, that's, that's weird. That's weird. Are you weird? You know, don't do that. Like, actually absorb everything and believe the person who's talking to you that those things... Do worry them. I had a job in a cash office in retail in a massive shopping centre up north. Um, we do have those. Um, 
and you know, and I'm counting money, and I'm just like a minimum wage worker, right? But I have this direct line to head office because if we lose ten pound, then I'm in trouble. And you do lose ten pound because we had fifty staff, and forty of them are students, and they steal everything in sight because they're Christmas temps, and they don't really care. Um, and so I get phone calls a lot, and I so then they would trigger my anxiety. And I tried to my I, my manager eventually said, look, we need to have a chat about the fact you keep like crying. Um, and I said, well, every time the phone rings, I genuinely think that that's me living on the street. Because I go like, oh my God, it's head office, I've lost money, I'm fired, I can't afford my rent, I'm on the street. And he just didn't understand it. And so most of my conversation was trying to get him to understand it. He doesn't have to understand, he just has to accept it. And then act. Um, this is the bit that everyone's falling over on, is that we're all talking, and some of us are listening. And, and, you know, and I, I talk to people at many jobs I've spoken to, kind of managers and stuff about my mental illness. And they all listen, and they're all very sympathetic, but nothing ever really changes. And you, know, and you end up finishing a load of conversations, and they say, well, is there anything else I can do for you? And you say, well, but you didn't do the thing we started talking about. You know, it's... And then what happens is that I stop speaking, because if I keep speaking to you, and then nothing changes, I go, well, there's no point talking to you anymore. And then the person on the other side goes, oh, Chad must be feeling better, because they've not spoken to me about this for like three weeks. It's not that, I've just, I'm fed up, you know, because again, it takes energy. It shouldn't be, if you're a manager of people, if you're a leader of people, that's your responsibility, it's not mine. I'm doing things to fix my mental health in other ways, you know, outside of work, you know, things like therapy or self-care or medication or whatever that may be for you. But the company, you have to start meeting people halfway. You can't just go, if they stop talking about it, they're better. That's, that's kind of not how this works. But I do get it's actually really hard for individual people to affect a lot of change. So as a company, these are some of the cool things I've actually worked out in places I work. So mental health days. So when we book a sickness in uh, and you get all those, you can you know, have like reasons. It's like you're sick, you've got the flu, you've got food poisoning, blah, blah, blah. We have mental health as one of the things that we can have sick days for. And that really helps me because it means actually I don't feel bad about taking sick days anymore. Because I used to take sick days and go, I've got a headache or I've got a cold. And I haven't. I'm just having a really, really bad day mental-wise. But actually... Because they say, oh, it's okay to take a mental health day. It's okay to take health because I'm not well enough to go into work, and that's a mental reason. That actually means I'm taking less days off work because I'm feeling much less guilty about it, and now I'm just kind of measuring it up properly like I would do if I had a cold or something. Think about meeting-free days. Uh, I think Facebook do this. Facebook do everything, don't they? Um, but having one day a week, we don't have any meetings, so people can just kind of, like, chill out for that day. It's really useful. Things, you know, like quiet spaces, things like varied social events, like it's not just alcohol. Um, it's not just like pizza and beer, it's a hack a day, it's a hack a do some free work because we're filling you with cheese, you know, but have, <laughs> have various things in different places, different, you can still do those things if you're doing other things, um, you know, have board game afternoons, um, have a, one of my previous employers, I think they have like a cheese guild, and so once a month, like, someone buys a load of cheese and they all like, hang out and eat cheese. Um, I'm not a cheese person, but if you are, that sounds great. Um, Haribo Guild, maybe I'm going to start one of those. <laughs> and think about having on-site help, so think about um, having maybe, you know, there are lots of things you can do around having like counsellors on-site and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm running hands over time, aren't I? There's a couple of resources then. There's open sourcing mental health. Um, they're Americans, and most of their guides are for um, think, uh, talking about things like the American... Americans with Disabilities Act. I think I've got that right. Yes. Um, but actually, a load of their blog posts and stuff are really, really cool and really, really helpful. Um, they have got a forum. I think it's called Dev Pressed. I think they've just yeah. taken that over. Um, but it's very depressing. Um, so kind of, it's just a bit of caution when you go on there because a lot of the, because it's a forum, so a lot of the for the thread titles can be quite heavy. Um, but if you want to talk to people, there's things like that. Um, also, Mind, who are the mental health charity for the UK. They've got loads of really cool resources. They have a social network called Ellie Friends, which is amazing, and not just because I used to work on it. Um, we usually just kind of talk to other people, um, just kind of about stuff and kind of get casual advice. And they've got kind of local chapters and stuff, so they're a really, really cool charity. Um, support them, people. And just thanks for listening.